Praise be Jesus Christ. I'd like to start this uh, this lesson off with the introit, which is the entrance antiphon given um, to us for the 26th Sunday of Ordinary Time. We'll go ahead and also, um, after this opening prayer, uh, this chant, we'll go ahead and read the gospel and then move on with the lesson. So this is taken from Philippians 2, uh, verses 10, 8, and 11. And I'm just going to go ahead and uh, chant the antiphon, move into the glory, be to the Father, and then back to the antiphon. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. At the name of the Lord, let every knee bend, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. For the Lord became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. That is why Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Glory to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. At the name of the Lord, let every knee bend, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. For the Lord became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. That is why Jesus Christ is the Lord, to the glory of God the Father. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, as uh, we move in just with this lesson, I'd like to um, read the gospel. This is uh, a gospel from Matthew, uh, chapter 21, verses 28 through 32. Jesus said to the chief priests and elders of the people, What is your opinion? A man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go out and work in the vineyard today. He said in reply, I will not. But afterwards, he changed his mind and went. The man came to the other son and gave the same order. He said in reply, Yes, sir, but did not go. Which of the two did his father's will? They answered, The first. Jesus said to them, Amen, I say to you, tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God before you. When John came to you, in the, way of, in the way of righteousness, you did not believe him, but tax collectors and prostitutes did. Yet even when you saw that, you did not change your minds and believe him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so with this lesson, I want to go ahead and look at uh, the sons here. I want to start, though, with, with, uh, with the reality, of course, um, for there to be a son... There must be a father. And, and the father that we're speaking of here in this gospel that Jesus tells of us, there's two sons. So we're going to put down son one and son two. And son one, uh, the father asks something of him, and he says no. With his words, he says no, but then he says yes with his action. When we get to son two, Jesus says that this son says, yes, sir. So he has a yes with his words, but then with his actual action, he has a no. He does not do the father's will. Now, when we look at these two sons, uh, the question that Jesus is, is asking is, which of these sons, son one or son two, actually did the father's will? And this is important because as Christians, we want to do the will of our Heavenly Father. We pray this in our, our Father. Um, every time we pray the Our Father, Thy will be done. 
Um, we also see this in Jesus' life, as we see that he says in the garden, Thy will be done. So with this, the goal is to, um, to do our Heavenly Father's will. One lesson that we take from this parable is, how do we go about doing that? Well, we, we look to the imitation of the first son. The son that even though he said he wouldn't, he ended up in the end actually doing the will of the Father. And so it's not just that we do words. Of course, the phrase that, that comes to mind is that actions speak louder than words. Now, in this parable, Jesus gives uh, an example of who the first son is and who the second son is. He says that the first son is the prostitutes. And, and also the uh, tax collectors. The second son, he says, are the, are the chief priests and the elders. So when he makes this connection, he says, he makes the connection that the prostitutes and the tax collectors, um, they, they said no. They, they weren't interested in following God. But when they heard the words of John the Baptist, they had a change, they had a conversion. Um, and so what we see with this group, we see that this is the category, but what we see is a change. That's real important, that there's this change here. Um, with this group, however, we see um, in, in the Sun 2 group with the, the chief priests and the elders, that it says actually, um, I'll, I'll read back at the gospel here, it says, yet even when you saw that, okay, so when you saw John the Baptist, and when you saw the conversion of prostitutes and tax collectors, even when you chief priests and elders saw this change, you did not change your minds and believe. You did not change. So this group did not change. They stayed um, in their disbelief. Um, you know, they, they stayed in judgment of this group. And... That, that's also a lesson to us. Many times when we see uh, sinners that, that maybe are in habitual sin, they're living uh, lifestyles that are not according to Christ and His church, um, and maybe they've been doing this for repeated, uh, repeated years, you know, once they change, once they have a conversion experience, how many times do we look at them and we're not inspired at all? Um, and we should be, uh, have great joy like the angels um, just when, when one sinner repents, how the angels are rejoicing, but yet we stand as the second son and look over here, and we're not happy. We can't join in, in their joy. So we really should, um, when those that are, that are converting, and when we ourselves should always be in conversion, that should bring us great joy. Um, I want to talk a little bit about this group, the tax collectors. And... and, and this is a group that, as we've heard in other parables that Jesus says, Jesus uses this group a lot. And the tax collectors, we have to remember, were, were people that have sold out to their people. These are Jewish people. Um, the Jewish people were occupied by the Romans, so the Romans were oppressing them. And the Jewish uh, a tax collector was a Jew that had sold out their own people. They, they worked with the Romans. Uh, they gathered enough money that the Romans required. They would give that to the Romans. And then on top of that... They could take whatever they wanted for themselves. So we see that Z Zacchaeus um, was, was, a, was a tax collector, and, and maybe possibly one of the, the most famous tax collectors that we know of is St. Matthew. Um, so these were people that, that maybe they had to give the Roman government $30, but they would charge 50 They would pocket the 20 and give the 30 to the Roman government. So the tax collectors uh, are a, a gr group of people that are hated. Um, and for them to convert makes this, this group very angry because this is the group that has, has said, yes, 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 I will do everything right, but then they're not doing everything right. Um, Jesus would call them whitewashed tombs. On the outside, they're saying yes, but on the inside, they're saying no. Um, and that's, that's also at the heart of this parable. So I, I want to share, actually, just a reflection on St. Matthew. There is a great uh, painting called The Call of St. Matthew. And in this painting, uh, the Holy Father, uh, Pope Francis, has recently um, spoke about this painting because it's one of his favorite. And in this painting, 
we have St. Matthew who is sitting at table and he's entertaining his guest and there's food on the table. It looks like they might be gambling a little bit or just whatever they are. And he's kind of sitting there and Jesus walks in to his house. Jesus, the Son of God, walks into the house of the sinner, the house of the tax collector. And as Jesus walks in, we see that he points in his hand um, is, is pointing to St. Matthew, who is over there at his table. And the hand, actually, if you look at it, and I believe it's Caravaggio that, that does this painting, but the hand looks exactly like the hand from uh, the creation. Uh, I think it's Michelangelo's creation, where God is reaching out. You probably remember it. God is reaching out with his finger, and then Adam's hand is almost pointing, uh, touching. And so this beautiful reaching out of the Father to touch mankind, um, his creation, and, and bringing this birth to the creation. What the artist wanted to do here is, is show that Jesus Christ is, is the Father, and that he reaches out, he points to St. Matthew, and by pointing to St. Matthew and saying, come and follow me, he is saying, I will make you a new creation. I will give you this spiritual birth. I am your Father. And so um, I want to I want to read now from John's Gospel, and this would have been obviously um, something that Matthew, who did answer that call to follow, would have been there at the Last Supper and heard these words. Um, so Jesus says to to his apostles at the Last Supper, he says, "Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you?" that I go to prepare a place for you. And when I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you also you may also be. And you know that the way where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. Henceforth, you know him and have seen him. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and we shall be satisfied. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you do not know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. So we'll come back to that, that, that last word. The words that I say to you, once again, the words that I say to you, I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his work. So there is also this connection that the words and the authority of Jesus Christ. The words of Jesus Christ are spoken by the authority of the Father, that Jesus is one in being, one consubstantial with the Father. And so the words of Christ are the words of God. Also, he says that uh, the Father dwells in me and does his work. The work of Christ is the work of God. And, and so we'll kind of go back to the words of Christ, the works of Christ, and, and what that means as well. Uh, but with this, what Jesus is saying is, if you have seen me, then you have seen the Father. So when Jesus goes in and calls St. Matthew, he is pointing to St. Matthew with that same finger, with that same uh, um, new birth and decision that God is, is reaching out to Adam. I will make you a new creation, tax collector. I will make you a new creation. I will give you a new life, um, sinner. And, and if you're willing to change, Okay, And Pope Francis, as he, as he meditates on this painting, and we can do the same thing, as we meditate on this painting, Pope Francis says, that finger is pointing at me. That finger of Jesus, that finger that gives new birth, that finger that calls the, the sinner from conversion into life, into new life, that finger is pointing at me. And that's exactly what, what this parable is talking about. This group is willing to change. This group is not willing to change. Now, with this, we have another, another um, 
option which is not given to us. Okay, so we, and uh, actually our, our, pre, our priest at, at his homily this Sunday actually preached on this. If you notice, both of these sons didn't do it right. This son says no with his words, but yes with his actions, or you could say his works. This son says yes with his words, but no with his works. Now, both of them, what, what, what's common to these two sons is, one, they are imperfect. If they would have said yes with their words, and yes, with their works, they would have been perfect. The second thing is, they're both called by the Father. And they have the same Father. So even though the prostitutes and tax collectors and chief priests and elders are, are kind of opposed to each other, they still have the same Father. Just as all of us have the same Father, um, our God. Okay? Now, with this, uh, we want to say, well, what, what would be the perfect option would be son three. And what would that look like if there was a third son? And sometimes with these parables, it's, it's, uh, it's this missing hole that we wish, man, I wish there was another option. And, and that's really the option that we want here. Because with this third son, there would be a yes and a yes. There would be a yes with the words and a yes with the works or the action. And this is the son that we want to be. Uh, that's the son that, that we actually uh, want to be. And we'll, we'll, go, we'll go back to this in just a second. Um, so right now, I just want to go ahead and put over here, talk a little bit about the father because we have the father here. The father is, is working with these two sons, and I want to just um, go a little bit with, um, maybe just talk about three things about God the Father, because we have to remember that we, we worship a God in three persons, all right, three persons and one God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and we have a relationship. This is the beautiful thing. Many times people say, do you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Well, we have a personal relationship with the first person of the Trinity, the Father, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit. And so right now we're going to talk about this personal relationship with God the Father. And, and what, are, what are three things that, that we know just initially about God is that, especially from this parable, is that God calls us. And he knows how we will answer. Isn't this interesting that the father here, he knows his sons. And especially in this case where the father is God, he knows his children. The father knows very well that this son, okay, he knows his personality, and he knows that this son will say no, but probably will do it. He knows that this son will, will say yes, but won't do it. Isn't it interesting that he still asks the sons to do the job anyways, even knowing what their response will be. He knows that this son will not do his will, but he asks him anyways. Why does God do this? Why does God, even if we know that he might, we, we may disobey, um, that he's going to do that anyways, that, that he's going to ask us anyways. He asks us because he, he wants to give us that free, that freedom to choose him. Um, it's similar, I guess, one, a good analogy would be if there's a mother baking a cake, um, th that the mother doesn't need anyone to help her bake the cake. She can, she's fully capable of baking the cake on her own. Now, she may uh, call her daughter into the kitchen and ask her daughter to, to help her bake the cake. Now, why would she do that? She doesn't need her daughter's help, but she asks her daughter to help. And the reason she does that is, is really for three reasons. There's probably more, but the three main reasons. And that is she wants to share in this experience with her daughter. She also wants to love her daughter, and she wants to teach her daughter. So we see, why is the father asking this of the son? He wants to teach, he wants to love, and he wants to share. This is the beauty of God, that, that he does not need us, but he loves us, and he, he asks us to participate in his divine life. 
he asks us to be co-workers with him in the vineyard. Um, another thing about the father is, you know, we ask the question is, well, well, who is the father? And this is very, this is very simple. He, he is. He is. The name that he gives Moses in the burning of the bush, when, when the, the revelation to Moses, that God reveals himself to Moses in the burning bushes, he says, I am. This is also what Jesus refers to himself. He says, I am. And, and so God, I am who I am, is. All right? How do you define the word is? It just is what it is. Um, so God exists. Now we know with everything, uh, as far as, as existence is concerned, we can ask uh, three questions about existence. You know, for instance, uh, we take this pen that I'm using here. And we can say, okay, well, it exists, obviously. So this means because it exists, someone created this. It created itself, or it always was. And so we can ask that of everything. We can ask that of myself. Um, someone created me. I created myself, or I always was. Okay? Now, when we, go to, when we go to God and say, okay, well, He exists, so did someone create Him? No, someone didn't create Him. If someone did, then that person would be God. And if someone created that, then that, and you have this infinite regression on and on and on. So we know that with God, because He is God, He exists, He always exists, and nothing created Him. He did not create Himself. He always existed. And so the other option is that he always was. Um, and that's what we're looking at with God. Now, another thing about God is that, and this is not the case with humans, but he is what he does. This is important. Uh, we can take two, two things here. We can take love and knowledge. Okay? The fact of, of knowing and the fact of loving. Now, you would, let's just take myself for instance. Um, I'm a human and I am capable of knowing things and I am capable of loving. Okay? So, Matt is what he does. That, that's, not, that's not true in the case of... Um, like when we say God is all loving or all knowing, this means that, you know, he, he is love. God is love. God is all knowing. Um, with me, with humans, for instance, I can know something and we work so hard to know something. I, I, can, I can come to a knowledge of something, but it seems like as much as I struggle to come to a knowledge of something, as soon as I know it, I begin to forget it. So I I'm, I'm never can say that I am all-knowing because I'm always learning and I'm always forgetting. So in the case, you can say that Matt knows something, but Matt is not knowledge. Okay? The better example would be, you can say Matt is loving, but you can never say Matt is love. With God, we can say God is love, which means His love is perfect and He always loves perfectly. There's never a time in which there's any change, okay, with God. God is all-knowing. There is never a time where He needs to know something, because He knows everything, and there's never a time in which He forgets anything. So, He is all-knowing, okay? Uh, and that's, that's important when we get to this other element of God does not change, okay? What we see with Son 1 is that they change. And this is a good thing, because they are becoming more like God. As humans, we want to change, and we want to change in the direction that we can become more like God, who does not change. For humans, we want to change and become like the unchangeable God, okay? With this group, though, they, they do not change. In fact, they refuse to change. By Sun Tzu saying, I refuse to change, what, what they're saying is, I am like God, or even... So bold, I am God. They, they think they don't need to change. And, and we should pray, God, please help us understand that 
we should always be changing, and we should always be changing in the direction towards God. The moment that we say, you know, I don't need any more change, that should be the moment that we're right before God face to face. And even then, He's going to be continually making us better and holier and, and be in that, in that perfection. So, as Jesus says, be perfect as your Heavenly Father is perfect. This group is not willing to change. This group is. Okay? Now, let's move to son three, which, which is really, we want to learn lessons from each of these sons. Um, and we're going we're gonna to kind of put a son three into the option, a perfect son. Okay? What can we learn from the prostitutes and tax collectors? We can learn that change is necessary and that we have to be changed. We have to change. Even if we have said no, 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 no. I will not serve you, God. It, and then we change and we actually do his will. No matter how many times we have said no to God, we, we can say yes. It is not too late to, to, in our actions, convert our life and to change our life. For this group, how many times do we say, oh yeah, I'll do it, I'll do it, no problem, I'll do it. I'll go to Mass, um, I'll start praying the Rosary, I'll do Liturgy of the Hours. Yeah, I'm going to do that. But then we don't. And this time we have to also realize that we are not perfect and that we still need God's help. Most of the time in this action, we have the right intention, but we need His grace necessary to move from words to work. It's important. We don't just want to stay at the level of words. We want to move in the intimacy of words to work. We see in a, in a marriage, you don't just want some words. You want an actual work behind that. Um, and we all want that. We want to move from words to works. Now, what we look at when we see this son is, is complete obedience. Um, now, with that, I want to go back to the introit, the uh, entrance antiphon, and I want to read this again from Philippians 2. At the name of the Lord, let every knee bend, in heaven, on earth, and under the earth. For the Lord became obedient unto death, even death on a cross. That is why Jesus Christ is the Lord to the glory of God the Father. So, for the Lord became obedient. Another lesson from this parable is obedience. This son, even though he said no, was obedient. This son said yes, but was not obedient. This is the perfect son. This is the son that his words and his works are equal. Okay? As we, um, as we said, uh, as John said in, in his gospel about Jesus at the Last Supper, that his words had the authority of God. Okay? I am the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? This truth. Okay? Also, what we see in the works and the actions is that Jesus says, God is working. The works of God are done through me. There is no separation, no dichotomy between the words of Christ and the works of Christ. Um, because the very incarnation means that the word became flesh. Okay? That the word became flesh, dwelt among us, worked among us, worked out specifically the salvation of the world. Okay, um, Even, even uh, in, in Philippians, we see that St. Paul says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Well, what are we doing when we work out our salvation with fear and trembling? We are working out our salvation by connecting ourselves to the holy works of Jesus Christ. We are co-workers with Christ, just as God has called us into His vineyard to do the work of God. Um, so this is the perfect Son. This is the Son that, that we um, need to conform to so that we can actually say yes to the Father and then actually do His will. That we can conform and obey and say, I will say this to you, I will say yes, give you my yes, and then I will act out that yes. And we can only do that through this Son. We can only do that with, through, and in Jesus Christ and the grace. The best way to be a son of the Father 
is to put on Christ, which we do at our baptism, and be connected to the one and only Son, um, Jesus Christ our Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.